In episode 10, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Pat Davidson, and I'm always speaking to other people who always have great things to say about their experience learning from Pat Davidson, whether it was in college when he was a professor, or it's more recent and they've been working as a practitioner and learning from his continuing education efforts. Pat always brings a combination of innovation, entertainment, and motivation around everything that he talks about. So we want him to talk about how he learned and what motivated him and who influenced him to becoming one of the most well-regarded influencers and educators in the fields of fitness, sports performance, and rehabilitation. I hope you enjoy our talk with Pat Davidson. Mr. Pat Davidson, or should I say Dr. Pat Davidson, I'm uh, glad to have you on. I had a speaker last week, uh, Michelle Bolin, talked a lot about you and your influence on her. And so I thought it would just be perfect to talk to you today about maybe what your influences were and what got you started as an educator um, in the field mm -hmm. of strength and conditioning, physio exercise, physiology, um, rehab, all of that stuff. And then how things have progressed for you, say, in the last five years, and more importantly, the last year, and how you're looking at education and, and, and influencing people about their, you know, what they study, uh, how they study, but also what they're going to do with their careers. Because it's, I think a lot mm -hmm. of people have that on their mind right now. It's like, okay, well, what's this going to look like? How am I going to move forward? Do I want to be a strength coach? Do I want to be a physical therapist? Do I want to be a fitness trainer? Uh, or do I want to be all three, uh, plus an educator? So I really wanted to get your opinion on this. I know you're, you're. I, I kind of see you as a, a a leader who's kind of done a lot of different things and can provide different perspectives. Um, and then you got your own special little twist to it as well. So maybe we maybe we can start from the beginning and sort of when you sort of got into. Okay, uh, I like this field. Uh, maybe I want to make some waves in this field. And how am I going to do that? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. And, you know, number one, I just want to say that it was really, uh, it was very cool to see the clip of your interview with Michelle from, from last week. And, you know, I'm very proud of her. I think she's just done an amazing job with her career. And, you know, I, I remember her from when she was doing her master's degree at Springfield. And she was a very, very diligent, hard worker then. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing to see when people are consistent and they continue to just year after year after year study and really um, practice their craft and get better, how far they can go. And I think she's a great example of that. As someone that truly loves this and, and is a lifer and will continue to learn and, and surround herself with really great people and practice this stuff in her own coaching, in her own training. And, and it's like just a certainty that she's going to have a really fulfilling career and be a really excellent professional for, for the remainder of her career. Um, and, and we just need a lot more Michelle Bolins out there in general. And, um, and to hear that I was a really strong influence on her is, is, is a great feeling, quite honestly. And, you know, knowing that I've had an impact on people educationally is one of the best feelings I've ever had in my life. Um, and it's very fulfilling for me, as opposed to other things, you know what I mean? Like, like money is, is great, but it's, it's very unsatisfying in comparison to knowing that you've really impacted someone and, and helped shape their career and the way that they put their life together. And to see them having success is, is so much more rewarding than, you know, having enough money to go on vacation or buy a car or something like that. Um, so I'm really grateful that I've been able to go in the career path that I have, even though it's like if someone, if someone were to like try to follow my path, I don't even know how I would, how I would begin to explain it to them. And I think in large part, because I, I was a kid that grew up with a lot of, of uh, 
of early problems in my life. And that, that really kind of like, I went into sports as an escape. And, you know, for me, it, it was like my home life didn't make much sense. It was, it was difficult. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of defiant and obstinate behaviors and characteristics that I was bringing to the table. But sports, when you're on the field, it's, it's very cut and dry. And either I can dominate or the other person can dominate. And it seems very fair. It doesn't matter if you are rich or privileged or, you know, good looking or ugly or whatever. Out here, it's just, you know, either, either you strike me out or I hit a home run or I put you on your ass, or you do it to me, or you, you dunk on somebody. It's, it's like a great equalizer in a lot of ways. And I really love that, and I love that the rules were defined, and that this line is out of bounds, and that, you know, all of those things are, are really fantastic, and that if I work hard, and I try, and I practice, I can get better, and I can move myself forward in life with that. And it seemed a lot more um, easy to navigate and to go into as compared to a lot of things that I struggled with a lot more like social interaction and relationships and things like that. So that, that's what helped me really get into the world of sports and then athletic development and fitness. And, you know, I think that I had natural ability from the standpoint of school and being able to read and write and synthesize information and speak in public as well. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I have a family. Um, I have a cousin who's very, very shy. Uh, I mean, she's, she's about as shy a person as you could ever meet. And I remember um, one day her coming home with this, like, you know, 99 on her, um, from her teacher for this public speaking project that they had in high school. And I remember thinking to myself, how the hell did she get a 99 for public speaking? And, and I was like, let me see that. And there was a whole write up from the teacher. And it was like, once again, she's demonstrated this incredible ability to articulate these concepts in her, her oratory and um, you know, just an outstanding confident presenter. And I was like, what that doesn't make any sense like this this i i can't get a word out of her i've never seen her talk to anybody uh in family get together things or, or anything like that but um you know she was able to really shine in public speaking examples and i feel like that's always been a strength for me as well and i feel very confident in that environment as opposed to maybe the more nuanced and intricate levels of like uh, interpersonal relationships where for me as a younger person, I really struggled, but in some ways, public speaking was more scripted. You know, I could, I could practice it beforehand. I could structure it and frame it and I could guide it in whatever way I wanted. I was in much more control of it. So I think I took a lot of these areas that I had strengths in athletics, training, um, you know, uh, reading, writing, being a student and getting good grades on tests and things like that, as well as public speaking. And I just kind of uh, brought them all together I, and, and they, they led me to this kind of career path. And, and it's one that, that's really helped me professionally emerge as, as someone that's become fairly well known in the fitness industry and in the performance world. And I've created my own little niche and, um, you know, it's, it's been very helpful from the standpoint of, you know, being able to do things like write books or give presentations or put seminars together and, and things like that. But I, I do feel as though when I'm really at my best is still these moments where I'm teaching. And that may be in one-on-one -on -one experiences, or it could be in a classroom, or it could be, you know, in, in any environment like that. Um, and, and not only, like it, it's, it's been something that, that yes, financially it's worked out well for me, better than I, I could have imagined, you know? I, I make a lot more money now than I did working as a professor at, at a higher ed institution. Um, but I think about the satisfaction I had of teaching classes and teaching semesters and watching 
the coursework unfold for students if I had them for multiple classes or, or across like, you know, the fall semester, the spring semester, uh, two years in a row, watching them take that information in. And, and of course, for me, I, I, I also had a number of students that, that I trained as athletes too and did the program design for. And so they could literally witness the way in which I was using this information that I was teaching them in the classroom, in the designs of programs that I was creating for them. And they could see I was living it too with my own training and competing in strongman and that sort of a thing. Uh, so it, it was much more than just like showing up for class, listening to the guy read the PowerPoint stuff. It was like, wow, this guy, this is like his life. Like this guy's not just like regurgitating information. This is like, you know, this is this guy like telling me everything that makes him tick practically that he's, you know, taken in, understands and, and is, is using to really power his own life as well as, as trying to, to give me this information that can be really valuable. And, and I really felt like I was able to connect with people and, and see them get excited. And I fed off of that to a great degree, seeing, seeing college students, uh, go on their internships and go to really awesome places and then come back and be really excited and be like, hey, you know, we were doing this cool thing down there. I can't wait to tell you about it. And I was like, yeah, tell me about it. I want to know. Like, I, I can't wait to hear about whatever, you know, training tactics they're using at Florida State or, you know, at Eric Cressy's place or at IFAST or, you know, UCLA or wherever it was that all these kids were going. And you know, it was, it was really kind of like this elite, you know, Springfield college. It felt like this great churning stew of like knowledge that was kind of bubbling over where I wanted to get back from them and give to them and, and, and really have this collective force of moving forward. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always hard to give these kinds of like origin stories or things like that, but you know, I think that kind of gets a big part of the point across in terms of, you know, my own kind of uh, moving into education and, and what it means to me. And, and that I truly do hope that I get to participate in education going forward. And, and to just finish by saying that when I educate and I put myself out there, oftentimes I see where my own deficiencies are and that I like to continue to learn so that I can fill those things in. And I love learning in many ways, just as much as I love educating, um, particularly from people that I, I think are, are truly masters at their craft. Now, um, you got a lot out of the, the, the university environment, the college environment, where there's some things, even when you're in it, where you're like, yeah, this is still kind of holding me back. It's kind of constraining. Uh, there, I'd love to do more. Uh, there's other areas I like to explore with the students and, and really get more interactive. Like, did you find that that was something that was kind of, uh, and, and it, maybe it wasn't the best fit, maybe at that time, but, you know, speak to me a bit about that. How was it? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, in some ways, I, I was so like a horse with blinders on doing my own thing that I missed the fact that I was doing some things that I probably shouldn't be. At, at, a, at a university and that I wasn't really like it, it was almost like if you had this department in front of you it, it would be like one of these things is not like the other and it would be very clear it would be me compared to the other faculty members in the same department I just didn't I didn't really fit in but I wasn't even paying attention to the fact that I wasn't fitting in and um you know I I uh so I didn't really feel that much in the way of of being you know, constrained by it or anything like that. But I, I also, uh, at least at Springfield College, I can say that um, I was not really participating in a lot of the things that I needed to from the standpoint of like, uh, you know, committees, like, you know, full participation on faculty committees, department committees, all these, I, I just wasn't even doing that part of the job. Um, you weren't you doing know, the politics. So you don't. You weren't handling I, the politics. I was not handling that at all. I just was like oblivious to it, and so I, you know, I was, I was really, 
I was so focused on, on putting my coursework together to the best degree that I possibly could. And, you know, I, I, I was coaching and competing at the time in strongman, you know, like that team uh, was a big part of my existence of, you know, we, we had, I, I, we were in the thirties for, for number of participants in, in this, you know, we called it iron sports. We had primarily strongman competitors, but we also had power lifters and Olympic lifters and bodybuilders and crossfitters. And, um, you know, we, we trained in the weight room at like, we had the worst time spot. It was like, I think like Monday and Friday at like 7 30 PM or something like that. Um, so I would be at the school all day. You know, I would be in my office, um, you know, just working on whatever, it, like, like breaking down, like, you know, I had this hard drive full of, you know, information from every coach imaginable going through videos of, of, uh, of, you know, whether it be, you know, sprinting or lectures or lifting technique or you know, a change of direction. I mean, it was just like, I had time to kill. You know what I mean? It was it was like, well, I finished teaching classes at two o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm gonna be here until the team practices at seven thirty. So I'll probably, you know, I'll have lunch, but then I'm just gonna be like on my computer studying this stuff for the next five hours, and I'd be doing that, you know, five times a week. So I was just like consuming information at a, at a very uh, high level at that point, and then training. And, and I was writing programs and doing all this kind of stuff, certainly grading papers. And I was on uh, student master's, uh, you know, theses and doctoral dissertations and stuff like that. So reading a lot of those kinds of papers and going through that kind of stuff, grading my own stuff for classwork things. But um, I, I didn't have that much in the way of distractions, which I kind of like. You know, it was Western Massachusetts, there's not a lot going on there. Uh, it was kind of like, I'd teach this information, I'd be learning more information from the standpoint of, of reading and studying, and then training, and uh, kind of a Groundhog Day version of that for months at a time. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that kind of existence. I wasn't well known at that, at that point in time. Um, I wasn't building a career based on a public persona. Uh, and I, I kind of liked it better in some ways, you know, I really did. It was like, I got my team, I'm competing in this sport. I teach my classes. Um, you know, I learn this information, I consume it. And, and, and it was, it was very simple and very satisfying. Um, it didn't last because again, I, I really, um, you know, it was, it was also like, I, I was a bit of an asshole too. You know what I mean? I just, I, I didn't fit in with that department. I didn't try to fit in with that department. I didn't even see what I was doing that was kind of a problem in terms of like, uh, you know, being a faculty member from the perception of other faculty members. And I, I just landed myself out of that gig. And, um, you know, I'm okay with life where it is and all that sort of stuff. But I, I, there's a part of me that wishes that I could have just done my whole career there and spent it, you know, in, in a quiet kind of a place, just developing these coaches behind the scenes. And, you know, it's taken me out of that role and into a completely different role of having a much more public persona and living in New York City and getting exposed to, you know, just a, a whole different world in, in the current life that I have. Um, but it's, um, it's, been, it's been really cool from the standpoint of uh of just learning more about other people learning more about myself kind of uh seeing that the the extent to which life can be funny and and odd and uh and and it's been it's been really beneficial in a lot of in a lot of ways i would never have imagined yeah i i honestly can't uh, i mean i think about your your style and, and the way you're uh, providing information. And I, I, I don't know if I could see you still in that university environment. It just doesn't seem like a good fit, at least from my perspective. And I, mm -hmm. I just see how much reach you have now where, you know, I understand you would have a quiet place to, to selectively work with uh, some students, but now, you know, 
you can reach a whole bunch of people and they could still be in university and still benefit from your stuff. So what are some of the things that kind of you've taken from that university experience and said, okay, uh, I got this freedom now. Um, I can still be based uh, in science, but now I can, I can take it to this new level and I can try some things. What are, what are some of the things that, that you think that you've taken from that university experience and expanded upon? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like, I, I think that I got a, a very good empirical foundation as a student at Springfield College. Um, you know, uh, Vince Pallone, who, who ran the PhD program that I was in, he was a, a hard-nosed dude that runs a really tight ship and, and was very good about getting us to learn how to be very thorough with, uh, with research and um, kind of, you know, the, 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 everyone that was involved with, with my education and the PhD process there, I think they did a very good job of, of preparing me to understand the empirical process and peer reviewed literature and different levels of evidence and how to be a very selective consumer of information and how to have a mind that is able to differentiate uh, and, and to see bias and to read the complete picture and to make an argument and to do all the things that are really valuable um, as, a, as a high level thinker. I think that they did a very good job of, of preparing me for that. And working as a faculty member at two different institutions, I worked with other faculty members that were really brilliant. I worked with a guy at Brooklyn College named Chris Dunbar, who is, um, you know, he, he's a really accomplished researcher in electrophysiology, um, in, in sort of cardiac electrophysiology. Um, and, and I mean, that man has a mind that is, is, is like a steel trap, you know, nothing gets through that he doesn't catch. It's like an incredible filter. Um, and, but it's funny, like working at Brooklyn College and then coming back to Springfield College, you see plenty of faculty members that are clearly like, uh, not well trained and really don't have very scientific minds at all. They're kind of like lazy and lackadaisical and don't particularly screen information well and don't see their own biases. And, um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of time it takes to uh, have your mind mature uh, with the empirical process and to catch your own limitations on that front. And mine certainly wasn't there finishing a PhD program. Uh, it certainly wasn't there after uh, a few years of, of teaching and as a professor and, and doing a few uh, peer reviewed papers and things of that nature. Even, even after that, like, you know, it, it took time, uh, you know, in, in this phase of my life as a, as a private sector individual to continue to refine that process and become a more critical thinker and, and to accept critical feedback from, from other people and, and to continue to progress. But I will say that, um, you know, overall, I was prepared to be able to go through this journey well through the, the classical foundational education system that I received. Um, and that it, it, it sets you up to be able to do the things that come after. Um, you know, it almost needs to prepare you to become a, a selective and appropriate uh, screen for information, and, as well as, as understanding the totality of information and the ability to, to, to consume it all and sort of see what's emerging from a pattern standpoint of what seems to be the truth in particular areas, um, as, as well as to try to take in thoughts, theories, and, and then just supportive hard uh, numbers and data that are really kind of the, the end product of all of it, but need to be interpreted properly. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, it's funny because sometimes you can begin to answer these kinds of, of topics and you forget what the original question was. And, and that's, you know, I know that you were, you were, you were kind of talking about um, the, the freedom of not being in, in, in a collegiate environment and um, 
and, and but at the same time, how you know being kind of an evidence-based thinker is is important and all that sort of stuff. That's that those are those are my my main thoughts on that. But um, you know, I, I think that in in a lot of ways you can hide in academia. And and that's really the, the final point I want to make. There's it's getting harder to in some ways, like there's more accountability for faculty from the standpoint of, of you know, job reviews and, um, you know, having to prove how many publications you did and, and, and demonstrate all these objective markers of, of research and competency and stuff like that. But even with that, I, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can hide in the, in the collegiate environment. And when you make yourself more of a public persona, there's less and less ability to hide and people will call you out on all kinds of stuff and people are willing to hurt your feelings and say whatever they want to say. And sometimes they're right. Sometimes it's completely baseless and meaningless. Um, but I, I think that, you know, I, I've had a tremendous amount of growth take place uh, as a, allowing my mind to mature and becoming a more sophisticated thinker and a more critical thinker through the criticism that I've gotten in the public forum. And I'm very grateful for that in, in all honesty, because most of it has been stuff that I at first buck and kick against, but then eventually internalize and realize that a lot of it has some validity and merit to it. And that if I can learn from it, I can, I can move forward and become a much more effective, uh, you know, purveyor of information. Yeah, because I mean, I hear both sides. I hear like, well, these people are too rigid in the science based community. And then you have the people who are just working with no boundaries whatsoever and making claims and fake this fake that. And unfortunately, it seems like the people who are sensationalistic are getting more likes and followers and all that. And that's just seems to be the way we're rolling in this uh, generation. So how do you balance that off? How do you go like, okay, I'm the science guy but mm -hmm. I've got to have a little bit of flair as well. And I've got to dress it up a bit more. And how do you balance that line and still be able to sleep at night and, and pay the bills? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I am, I use a lot of inflammatory language um, very purposefully. And, but it's usually, I only use it when I, when I'm really talking about a topic that I, I, fundamentally believe you know it's it's i never throw things out there just to cause a stir like i usually mean everything that i'm saying unless it's absolutely purely satirical or something like that but um but i usually do have a, a very strong you know some kind of a theoretical supportive foundation or i'm away you know it's like some people, I'm amazed at how some people just memorize like authors and years and things like that of research. I'm like, how do you know that like Jensen et al. from 97 wrote this paper? Like, that's incredible. Why, why is that something that's like just available, ready to go in your brain? Like, I can't remember authors and years of papers ever. But, you know, there's, there's you know, I, I've certainly participated in, in lit reviews and I've I've researched topics and written like academic papers and, and done that kind of stuff in the past. And I'm aware of how arduous a process that is. Um, but, and, and there's just a lot of that kind of stuff that, that is in the back of my head when I think about training, like, you know, basically like foundational, solid research supported concepts that guide my brain when it comes to you know, training methods and adaptations that you're going to be after. And oftentimes I'll, I'll see like things that I think are, are poor training methods uh, that are, you know, posted on social media or just thrown out there in some way. You know, I, I have a number of people that share things with me on social media. So, you know, they'll send over um, in, in the direct message like, hey, look at this video of this person doing this thing that I, I'm sure is going to drive you crazy. And of course, they're right. Like People know how to like get me going. Like, hey, watch this professional athlete like try to jump on top of this 
mountain of stacked boxes, like hey, this will this will make you upset and probably make you go on a rant and come up with a post. And and they're right, it usually does. So I, I have all this ammunition that just fuels me. Um, and and I just try to think about and also like being in New York City uh, and seeing personal training, you, you basically see every flavor of the month all the time, just kind of like getting shaken up and like thrown out in front of you to, to witness with with people that are like true believers in whatever concept it is that they're they're trying to dole out to the clients that they're working with or seeing in their own training or something like that. And then being like, wow, I've literally never seen a human being do this before in a training environment. Like, where did you even come up with this? Like, I, what is the, what's the point of what you're trying to do? And oftentimes, like, sometimes it's like, uh, if it's in social media, you'll see these written descriptions of like, I'm doing this drill for this reason. And it's like, wow, that, that doesn't make any sense at all. Like, um, or if I'm witnessing someone do something and I ask them like, Hey, why are you doing this thing? And they tell me I'm doing it for this reason. And I'm like, this again is, this makes no sense. Like there, there, there are, you know, these, these historical precedented methods of training that have been corroborated as being effective for driving these kinds of adaptations. And, and that's why people have been doing these things for a long time. And, and what you're doing in no way, shape, or form resembles that. And it resembles this other thing that research has demonstrated is not effective for, you know, so it's like, you know, a lot of it will be like these weird balance drills or something like that, you know, where you're like, if you read the literature in that area, it's kind of like, um, you know, balance is very task specific and like just because you can uh, surf doesn't mean you're going to immediately be able to snowboard. <clears throat> like there's no transfer of one to the other. Uh, yes, someone that's good at snowboarding, if they learn how to um, surf, is probably also going to be good at surfing. They probably have, <coughs> excuse me, uh, anthropometric characteristics that are great for those kinds of activities. And <coughs> I apologize. It's the uh, it's the COVID. That's a terrible joke. <laughs> the COVID cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> but um, hopefully this goes away soon. I've been doing a lot of talking today, so I feel like that can happen. I don't have any water with me either. But um, it's kind of like you you know you'll see that as a for instance, and it's like I don't think that <clears throat> you building this kind of like you know, mousetrap looking operation around a gym with like BOSU balls here and wobble discs over here and you're jumping from this one to that one. I don't know if this is actually leading you towards the desired adaptations to be a better safety in the NFL. It seems really counterproductive in terms of use of time. I could see a high risk of injury being present with these things. So not only is it something that's not going to be beneficial, but it could simultaneously be very detrimental. And yes, I get it. You're 24 years old and your trainer is 27 years old and you both think that you're bulletproof. But I got news for you, man. People have slipped and fallen and done things like broken wrists before and then been out for several months and then become deconditioned and then when they come back, they pull hamstrings or Achilles go or something else that's like, you know, uh, and, and then like, hey, you were just another flash in the pan whose career ended way too soon. And you won't even see the chain of events that led you towards this like terrible end thing that took place. Um, so, you know, there's just a lot of that stuff out there. and you know, it's kind of like, it's unfortunate because there's good information that exists and there's great coaches that are available. And oftentimes, no, they don't get as many likes and shares on social media. So their, their information becomes less wet, less spread as compared to the person that's doing 
really bizarre things on, you know, really bizarre surfaces that, you know, it's, it's, and it's just so, it's so, par- it's, it's just so frequent. It's like, God, like, is no one else seeing this and aware that this is tragic stuff that's happening? Like, I'm not going to keep my mouth shut. Like, this is awful. And these are multi, multi million dollar assets that are just being like treated like they're, they're two cent Tonka toys. Like, uh, somebody needs to, to kind of step up and, and shine the spotlight on this and say that this is egregious. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And, and I had a talk with an NFL team yesterday about, you know, things that I don't want people doing in the off season. One of them was like, I don't want to see guys doing agility on the sand at the beach. Like it, it makes absolutely mm-hmm. no sense in terms of the physics and the, you know, physiology. So yeah, somebody has to say something. And I know with your approach obviously based in science but you're in there you're grinding and you're doing everything that you're prescribing which is something we don't we well we rarely see from science-based people we don't see them out there like oh okay this is the theory and you know doing the training that they studied but you're doing that and you're i'm not saying you're putting yourself at risk but certainly you're putting yourself out there and showing people like hey i'm going to stick to my guns and and what i say is what i do and is that a concerted effort on your part to, to really demonstrate your knowledge? It is. I, I do think there's an element of that. It's also just like, I don't even know what the hell else I would do in some ways. Like I've always trained. Um, I love it. And, and I don't think I ever won't train. It's like, I'll probably be preparing for the NFL combine when I'm 75 years old. Like, cause it's just, it's just kind of how I've always lived. And, um, and it, 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 it gives, it gives me a feeling of, of direction in my life. And, um, so if there's, there is that, and it, it also, I, I feel like, um, like you can get lost, like you can, you can kind of get introduced to new exotic methods of training and you, you might go somewhere where, where the presenter is so charismatic that they convince you like, oh my God, this is the golden goose egg. And, and I think you got to really try this stuff and, and, and witness it and measure stuff and see what's happening. And then you can be like, well, yeah, my, my, uh, you know, my, my hips feel great, but I got weaker and slower simultaneously. That is also not good. Like, uh, you know, clearly I still need to do some, some fast running and some strength training if I care about those variables which are important variables for, for athletic populations. So, you know, I, I, I think like, you know, that's, that's just really to me, like, I don't know how you would know something as a coach and someone trying to, to get information across to people uh, unless you're really invested in it, like with skin in the game. Um, you know, I think about some of the, the, the more historical uh, sports science figures, like even A.V. Hill, you know, from the stories I heard about him, when he was figuring out the concepts related to direct measurement of VO2 from gas collection and how you would know that it's a VO2 max test, he was testing himself over and over again. Um, and I don't know if it was Hakkinen, the, the, uh, the Scandinavian researcher, but I believe one him or one of the other guys, Comey, uh, like performed a surgical operation on themselves and like inserted a, a tensiometer like in their Achilles to be able to measure those strain forces from elastic types of things. Like these guys were savages. Um, and, and like A.V. Hill, to understand the difference between uh, a VO2 peak and a VO2 max test, that's a crazy thing to actually figure out. Uh, a VO2 max test is you do a graded exercise test and at a certain point, you increase the exercise intensity for probably a three-minute block of exercise, and your heart rate and your VO2 don't go up. So you are already at max VO2 for three minutes, max heart rate for three minutes, and then you increase the intensity, lasted an additional three minutes, and your heart rate and VO2 stayed the same. 
that is an atrocious thing to do to yourself. Like uh, 99% of human beings on this planet cannot do that. 99% of athletes on this planet can't do that. You have to really, like, to be at max heart rate for three straight minutes is one of the worst possible feelings that you could go through. To be at max heart rate for six straight minutes, three of which are an intensity level above your aerobic max is borderline insane. And he had to do that to himself repeatedly to be able to figure out the difference uh, of what a true max test really is. Uh, because all we really do in, in laboratories is a peak test. And we don't ever actually measure people's true VO2 max because people can't psychologically handle it. Um, so, you know, those are the kinds of people that are like my idols, you know, like, and, and yeah, I, I just feel like, why, why did you get into this if you didn't have that kind of obsessive sort of desire to, to use this as a tool? You know, like, I, I can't relate to that in a lot of ways. Like, you're just doing this to learn about it? Like, why are you learning about this? Like, you don't have this absolute obsession with seeing how fast a human being can run? Like, that to me makes sense. Like, you know, you were at this absolute edge for this given distance and how fast a human being can run that. And you're looking to be able to nudge yourself a little bit farther on that edge. And to do that, you need to consume every bit of information from the smartest, most sophisticated sources you can, because maybe it makes like a 0.1% difference, which is an enormous difference at that level. Yeah. And that's, that's what I enjoy about the stuff that you're putting out there is that you are doing that. You are putting yourself out there and, and testing yourself and we all get to see you suffer, which is pretty awesome too. <laughs> so now moving forward, let's assume you know, we all get vaccinated, things are looking better. What are some projects that you're going to focus on, say, in the next six months to a year here? Or do you see yourself doing some different stuff? Yeah, um, you know, it's, I have uh, this whole rethinking the big patterns world of stuff where, um, you know, I, I, I've created this online platform. It just needs to be like literally like, I don't know, a button press to get it live or something along those lines. But I, I'm, I'm going to have it as a certification model where people will have to go online and watch introductory lectures and then take a, a quiz on it and pass that quiz. And once they do that, they'll be able to go to in-person seminars. And there'll be three different divisions of seminars that people will have to attend. And once they've done those, then they can go back online and take this big final exam that will be based on uh, the seminar information and also the, the whole book itself. Uh, because I, I want this, I, I really, I think that I did a pretty good job with the book and, and really consolidating a lot of quality training information as well as a, as a model that really ties it all together. I, I, I um, you know, and and to I think that if people are versed in the whole thing, and they and I've tested it uh, in some reasonable way to say like, hey, this person they knows what they know what they're doing from the standpoint of the way that the model works and how to coach exercises according to, you know, the way I put it together. I feel pretty pretty confident in giving this person a stamp of approval, and I think that you know if you're looking to hire a qualified coach that knows what they're doing in terms of working with athletes in general population, I, I think that this is a really good certification to be able to put next to your name and say, yeah, like, you know what, this person managed to go through this whole thing. Like, this is a high-level coach. Um, that's my big, big thing. And, and I really am looking forward to the in-person stuff after COVID. Uh, I think it was in the Clubhouse talk last week that you mentioned it's almost like seeing a a band live again like people yeah. are going to be hungry for that and i i agree like i'm i'm i really miss seeing other people in the industry in educational environments like i've always enjoyed that and and i really hope to be able to to have that again 
and um, and build something. You know, I, I've seen a lot of different certification systems exist, and I've I've just never felt like any of them have either been thorough enough or they're they're too niche or something. You know, it's kind of like I, I wanted this to be a very very much a totality based approach like this person can understand big picture theory but they can also coach a damn squat you know and they know how to get someone to do an a run properly and they know how to get someone to throw a med ball properly so it's it's time it's time and it's work and it's like uh that's 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 where i want my own particular product to to live within this fitness sphere um but yeah I, i'm definitely uh looking forward to doing more in person things and just interacting with, with people from from other places again yeah um you know i i i think you're right i think uh it's nice to have that virtual stuff available to people but really, uh, you know, if they have a chance to see you in person, I would highly recommend that too, right? You know, it's it's nice to have that as supporting elements, but but being live at a, a Pat Davidson uh, touring event is is an ex- experience in itself. So, are you still pretty much funneling people through your Instagram account to get to your your resources? Yeah, that's that's the the everything that I've got is, is through the bio link in Instagram right now, um, and it's like I, I'm going to have to actually. I'm glad I do these things because it reminds me like, oh yeah, I really have to get this online thing like going again. Yeah, yeah. I've been kind of delaying it because I, I really, a big part of it is really doing the in-person seminars. Yep. Um, but, and it's like, I don't even know when the hell are we ever going to do this again? But, uh, you know, there's there's really no reason to, to not get things started and to create that impetus and have some momentum take place to get the ball rolling. Um, but I, th- that's the big thing that, that I'm going to be uh, working on and trying to offer from an educational standpoint going forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Hopefully, maybe fall 2021. I don't know. I, w- I want to be able to fly out to New York and hang out with you and, and maybe combine some stuff together and, and do some in-person stuff. So we'll, we'll be looking forward to that, but I just want to thank you again. Uh, big fan of yours and uh, always pushing people to your content. Cause I think it's valuable because you bring that science-based approach with that passion. And I think that's, that's really important. Well, it's a very mutual kind of a, of a situation here because I've, I've really uh, taken a tremendous amount of learning away from every experience i've had with you uh you know you are truly one of the the great coaches that has ever been in this industry and i i really do admire the way that you carry yourself conduct yourself and uh and just overall your your the totality of your career and what you've you've been for the people that have learned from you which is really inspirational as well as as a valuable educational source well yeah likewise right back at you you're right it is mutual so um yeah uh, whenever people get a chance check out pat davidson instagram in person and uh you won't be disappointed so thank you very much for doing this pat thank you Derek. and i'll talk to you pretty soon yeah likewise take care 